Um, so yeah, today I'll be talking about um, how to train your own large language models. So this is going to be based off a blog post that we actually published um, this week. So it's very much hot off the press and uh, you know has has a lot of uh, areas that that require additional information and updates. Okay, so like uh, an agenda or overview I want to go over. Um, the first is, should you be training your own LLMs? I actually wasn't here yesterday, but I saw on the agenda that there was a section called, should you train your own LLMs? And I hope the answer wasn't no, because then I'm just wasting everyone's yeah. time. Um, but uh, in case people want to train their own LLMs, I'll discuss uh, some of the data pipelines, um, then model training and evaluation, um, the process of getting your model actually into, into production and in front of users, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about the lessons learned and, and the next steps. So that first question of why actually train your own LLMs. Um, it's, there are any number of, of reasons why a company might want to uh, train their own LLMs. And these are only a few of them listed here. And these are some of the most important ones to us at, at Replit. Um, the top one is customization. So just being able to do things that general purpose models aren't very well suited for. So things like GPT-4 or ChatGPT Turbo um, might not be suited for, for uh, code use cases, for example, for code completion. And, um, and even within code completion models like Codex, you still are going to get um, code models that are customized for specific languages. Um, at Replit, we get a lot of uh, web-based use cases, and so people like to use a lot of JSX, um, TSX, and so we train our models uh, overweight on, on those languages um, as opposed to some, some of the others. Uh, we even actually tried to do, uh, because um, uh, ChatGPT, uh, the 3.5 Turbo model, was so fast, we actually tried to use it for code completion once to, to test, and we just, no matter what we did, we just couldn't get it to actually write and, and complete some code. Um, another reason is reduced dependency, and so uh, we think this is really important that, you know, uh, different companies, different people, and, and developers have access to these language models and aren't just reliant on, on a handful of, of uh, tech firms. Um, for us, cost efficiency is also a really big reason, and so we want to create these, these models to be much smaller and, and more efficient so that we can bring them to, to everyone. Um, Copilot still costs, I don't know what it is, 10 bucks a month, something like that. Um, we have 20 million users on, on Replit, and we just can't pay that level of API cost for, for our users, and we want to bring um, Ghostwriter to everyone for, uh, for free eventually. and so. That requires training much more cost-efficient models and hosting them at, at drastically reduced costs. Um, some other reasons, data privacy and security. So obviously a lot of people don't want their data information going to, uh, to OpenAI or, or Google or, or elsewhere. Um, and then uh, control over updates and improvements and, and of course just having the IP of, of a trained model. Um, so what I'll be talking about this, this process is for uh, the Ghostwriter code completion model. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with, with Ghostwriter, it's a um, competitor to Copilot in, in a few ways. And in this particular um, example, it's a code completion, if it loads, uh, is the code completion example. So this is different from the Ghostwriter chat product where you, you can talk to Ghostwriter, ask questions and whatnot. Um, this is more for uh, next token prediction, uh, given the context of, of a code file. And so, um, loading issues, but uh, this is you know the, the type of model where you're gonna feed it code in any number of languages, and uh, given the context, what's fed in, it's going to predict um, the next level, or uh, a block, or multi-line completion. Um, can't see me get this to load, but I will move on. Okay, um, so what is the, the tech stack that we use for this? Um, the, the sort of like modern LLM stack that, uh, that we think at least is, is the modern stack at, at Replit. 
Um, we use Databricks for all of our, our data pipelines, and so that, that includes all of the pre-processing, the summary statistics, analytics, um, transformations, and, and pretty much everything else. It, it falls pretty central in the, in the diagram of our, of our use case. Um, Hugging Face, which I'm sure everyone is familiar with here and, and uses all the time. Uh, so a great resource for data sets, uh, pre-trained models, tokenizers, and, and various inference tools, um, especially for code. We'll, we make use of their, uh, of their inference tools, and I'll talk about that a bit later. Uh, and then Mosaic ML, which um, brands itself kind of as the, as the Databricks of GPUs and, and model training. And so they have uh, a lot of um, great ability to, to scale up GPU nodes uh, and, and run um, distributed training. And they also have a, a ton of pre-configured uh, LLM configurations for training and, and managed GPU infrastructure. So this is the diagram that kind of lays out what our, what our process looks like at a, at a pretty high level. Um, I'll, I'll probably come back to this diagram a good number of times throughout, uh, throughout this talk just because it really shows how everything is, is kind of tied together. Um, the three stages of, of this diagram, um, one would be uh, data processing. Uh, is, is the first stage. So everything that, that falls under this sort of um, Databricks umbrella, we consider data processing. And, and that's where we spend the majority of, of uh, time and, and effort in this process. Um, then you have the, the, the actual model training. And so this is this kind of mosaic ML portion of the diagram. Um, so the ability to scale up GPU clusters and nodes, actual, actually run the training. And then there's um, what we call, you know, inference or, or production uh, or deployment to production. And so this is actually hosting the model, um, making it uh, run inference much more quickly, being able to do model evaluation and, uh, and deploying these models up on a server where, where the replica client and the user can actually access them. So let's start with that first um, portion, which is the, the data pipelines. Um, obviously, there, there's uh, way more than I could possibly go into in, in 30 minutes, but um, I'll just give some, some uh, broad overview. Uh, so we start with a large corpus of, of permissive, permissively licensed uh, code data from the stack, and um, the deduped version of, of this data set is, is available on Hugging Face in, in Parquet format or the Hugging Face data set format. Um, so this is a, a data set collection. It comes from uh, the GitHub archive, uh, a bunch of different repos, a raw data set that then they um, uh, select based on various extensions, based on languages, and, and they do um, license filtering and, and near de deduplication on this. Um, I believe the number of languages is something like 358 programming languages, so they have uh, everything on there. And, and it's the primary data set that we start with for, for training code models. Yes? Yes, there are definitely going to be bugs in that code. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so we'll, we'll talk about that um, uh, in, a, in a second. I mean, it's, we can identify some of them uh, and then deal with them ideally, but uh, it's, it's kind of one of the things that comes with the, with the territory. And, and there are different ways to increase the quality of your, of your training data, and, and I'll talk about those in a, in a minute. Um, so it's, it's kind of a, a funny process. If you look at this diagram, we, we start on Hugging Face with the stack dedupe and almost immediately go to a different format um, within, within Databricks. And um, that is because uh, Databricks allows us, it's, it's what we use for all of our processing and transformations. Um, I'm sure a lot of people here probably use the, have used the Transformers library from Hugging Face in, in some form. Um, and, and Transformers is great. It, it really abstracts away a lot of the issues or um, complications of working with, with this type of, of data and for, for these various purposes. But if you want to train your own models, you really need much more control over the data um, in, in a way that you just can't get from the, the Transformers library. And so 
that's part of the, uh, the motivation is to um, move it onto a platform where you can deal with data at scale and, and from a variety of different sources. And so, like the, the next bullet point says, it makes it easier to actually include additional data sources, and, and that includes any kind of proprietary data that you have, or any data set that's just not on, on Hugging Face. Um, so at Replit, we have uh, proprietary data sources and, and things like public REPLs, and so uh, we wouldn't want to put those up on Hugging Face if we ever wanted to um, include them in, in the training set, for example. Um, another reason is just the scale that you can process at uh, on Databricks, and so uh, all of the pre-processing and transformations we can run in, in distributed fashion, and so this allows you to speed up, um, scale the process and, and speed it up uh, dramatically to, um, you know, to, to speed up critical pipe parts of the pipeline and, um, in, in linear fashion. And then lastly, it's a very tractable and, and extensible process. So we actually do a lot of this work just in, in notebooks, and, and we can track the uh, progress of, of each of these runs. We can keep track of um, all of the different data analytics that we do along the way, the samples that go into the training and, and whatnot. Um, so here's an example of, of that. Um, of some of these like transformations. So this is done in a, in a Databricks notebook. Um, and, and a lot of the, the kind of pre-processing uh, steps that I'll, that I'll go into next, it's, it's really important to dive into your data and really understand it and, and have a 360 degree view of, of what's inside. Um, even even deduped uh, 2.7 terabytes of, of code data is a, is a ton to look at. And you're going to find a lot of uh, a lot of garbage in there, and even the steps that you want to take, so things like being able to remove bugs from code, um, or just even being able to remove things like binary files or or any other sort of garbage that that may have ended up in there. Um, there's really no good way but to be able to uh, analyze this data at scale and actually just jump into it and, and look at it. So here's an example of of something we might do where uh, we try to, we remove auto-generated code from, from the data. Um, just because a lot of this is going to introduce duplicates and, and really reinforce certain coding styles that we may not uh, necessarily want the, the model to, um, to pick up on. And so uh, we, we have this, this process where we run uh, heuristics and, and uh, regex is uh, over the data to identify anything that's auto-generated. Um, once you do, you want to actually be able to go back and say, here's what the data that was flagged as auto-generated looks like. Um, so in Python, I believe it was something like 4% of the data is, is auto-generated, and you want to be able to, along the way, uh, go back, look, and see, okay, it looks like this is code that's typically generated by Django, and there's a few other of these, uh, of, of these frameworks, and so that's what we're throwing out. So this is what I mean by that kind of tractable process, is that at every step of the way, you can actually go dive into the data and see what it is that's going to be fed downstream into the model. Um, so then the actual pre-processing steps that that we take. Uh, first, it's really important to anonymize the, the data, and so we do this by um, identifying and removing any kind of emails, uh, IP addresses, and, and secret keys. Um, we replace a lot of these with, you know, a list of, let's say, like 10 um, sample emails that, that would replace any kind of email in the, in the code process, just to keep the structure of the code uh, the same, but then you're basically using, uh, you know, mass tokens uh, for, for replacing those emails or, or addresses or keys. Um, we remove auto-generated code, so as I just said, we'll use standard regex and, and other heuristics to kind of go through and, and scrub the data of any um, auto-generated code that, um, this, this also includes, uh, this is much harder to do with, with heuristics, but things like um, minified code in, in JavaScript, uh, you try to remove using a various uh, heuristics and number of, uh, of filters um, when, when analyzing the data. Um, we remove code that doesn't compile or is not parsable, and so this is our attempt to remove um, bugs. Obviously, it's very limited, and, and there isn't really much we can, uh, we can do beyond that, but 
uh, at least for a subset of languages where we're actually able to evaluate the language. We, we do this to remove anything that um, doesn't look uh, like, like legitimate code or, or something that would actually be able to, to run. Um, this is also really important for, uh, at least in the Python use case. So if you use, for example, AST to parse uh, the Python code, well, you'll end up getting, um, that'll, that'll help you remove a lot of Python 2 data that, that ends up in the data set. And so that's not something that you want to feed uh, the model um, to, to use Python 2 code um, in, in training. And so um, using, using that check on parsability uh, really helps there. Uh, and then we have any number of filters based on average line length, maximum line length, percentage of alphanumeric characters, all of, all of that type of stuff. Um, there are, uh, in terms of the question earlier as to, as to the bugs, um, there are things that you can do to try and increase the quality of, of your uh, model's code. And so you can try to do things like filter based on the number of GitHub stars or, um, or, or some other kind of metric of, of quality. I've seen some filters based on like the number of GitHub issues, for example. Um, we didn't find any evidence that much of that stuff helps, and, and from what I remember, a lot of the papers that I've, that I've seen don't really find uh, that, that that helps all that much either. So one of the other things that we do is we train our own tokenizer, and so uh, at, at their core, the tokenizers are made up of, of an algorithm, the tokenization algorithm, which is the model, uh, and then the underlying vocabulary. and. Um, you know, many of the standard tokenizers are, are available on Hugging Face. We started out using uh, the Codex slash CodeGen um, tokenizer initially, but then we decided we train our own uh, custom vocabulary from the underlying training data. Um, so the way that this works is you, um, you have your pre-processed pre uh, training data. I'm not sure how visible this is, but I'll just talk through it quickly. Uh, the pre-processed training data, which um, you use to train the same tokenizer, and so it's on, on the same underlying sample uh, that your tokenizer is supposed to cover. And, um, and then you can do things like test how much of the tokenizer is, is actually covered, or how, many, how much of the tokens are actually covered by um, the tokenizer. You can blow up the vocabulary size if you try to do 100%, um, but often there's a a sweet spot where you can cover the vast majority of, of tokens and keep your, your vocabulary small. Um, once you have this tokenizer, it actually feeds right back into the tokenization process, which is the next step of, of the data pipeline. And so it's very much integrated from the moment that you actually train the tokenizer. Um, it goes right back into the data pipeline. It goes into your training process. Um, and it feeds back into uh, inference time. And so. You should feel really good about your tokenizer when you have it and, and know that it'll stick around and, and be with you for, for some time. Um, here is, well, I guess first I should say, why do we do this? Um, there are some benefits to having a, a custom vocabulary and custom tokenizer for, for your model, um, especially if you have a domain-specific uh, data set or, or s something that doesn't require uh, you to produce as much general language. So here's, a, here's an example of what this looks like. Um, so on the left, you have the Codex tokenizer. Uh, this is what's used for Copilot, but it's also what's used just by OpenAI. So this is the OpenAI tokenizer with some um, differences. It's, it's you know, the same thing that's used for general language. And then on the right is our uh, tokenizer, the Ghostwriter tokenizer. Um, and this was trained on the underlying code data. And what you can do is you can just scroll through the tokens and see um, at about, you know, I mean, you start to see it much earlier, but definitely by the 4,000 mark, um, the Codex tokenizer is well into natural language. And it's talking about, you know, French, drink, minister, all of, all of these terms that just aren't as likely to come up in code. And, and still at that point, based on the frequency of, of tokens that it's seen, our tokenizer is very much writing code. Its, it's uh, tokens are much more oriented for the use case. And so that means at the end of the day, we have a smaller tokenizer, smaller vocabulary. Uh, it speeds up model training, it speeds up inference, and, and captures a lot more information in the, 
in the same block of context. Okay. Um, with that, I'll move on to um, model training. So uh, we train our models on, on Mosaic ML. Um, I'm just curious, I'm sure a lot of people have, have uh, heard of and used Databricks and Hugging Face. Be curious to see, raise of hands, how many people have used Mosaic or, or heard of them? Okay. Decent number of, of, of people. Um, so, so Mosaic uh, ML, as I, as I mentioned earlier, is a bit kind of like the, the Databricks of, of GPUs and model training. And so um, some of the key benefits that they provide, one is GPUs for multiple cloud providers. And so anyone who's been trying to acquire GPUs and, and have them available uh, to train knows what a pain that this can be, um, especially to get, uh, get it from you know, different cloud providers if you're primarily an AWS shop or GCP shop or, or whatever else. Um, and so uh, they've, They've uh, done some deals with different cloud providers and, and have uh, GPUs readily available from, for them and uh, usually at, at kind of reduced prices. And you can also do this or integrate with them without having to actually sign up for that cloud provider, which is, a, is an added benefit just because it um, requires a lot of work to you know, integrate uh, a new account there. Um, they also have a ton of uh, well-tuned LLM training configurations and so they've thought carefully about various learning rates, batch sizes, um, all of the different configuration trade-offs and, and actually run these for uh, specific models and to both make sure that um, you know, the loss curves are declining but also make sure that there's a lot of GPU uh, throughput and, and that the performance of the GPU is, is saturated and it's making full use of all your compute resources. Um, and this managed infrastructure deals with fault tolerance, so if a node fails, it comes back up. Uh, and then they have a, a easy to use CLI for kicking off these training runs. Um, so we used to do this, this stuff on our own, um, found that, that all of these benefits were really worth using uh, Mosaic ML instead. Um, we kick off our, our training runs, and then we get to watch these like pretty loss curves hopefully come down and hopefully not spike. Um, and, and we use weights and biases for these for this um, logging, so pretty standard part of the um, of the stack as well. Um, then I will move on to um, to testing. So uh, testing your models is actually one of the most difficult things to do. We found and and a really time consuming uh, thing to to get right. Um, so. Uh, one of the main methods, at least for code, is using something called human eval, which always bothered me because it's not, there's like no human involved in this system. Um, it basically just gives a prompt to, to the model. In this case, it's saying in, in Python to write a function, it returns the sum of numbers from one to n, um, and then it gives it a function signature uh, definition of, of sum of numbers. And then here on the output, the, the model produces an output and then we can actually run uh, a test to see did this produce um, what, was, what was expected. Did the output of the model, um, once we execute that output, does this produce the, um, the test result that, that we expected? Um, this is where Hugging Face's uh, code inference actually comes in really handy because you can just run uh, at least Python code and run through these test cases pretty quickly. Um, there are a lot of other complications here. Um, one, uh, one significant one, uh, even within Python, is just the amount of time that it takes to run this. And so at this stage, inference is still really slow. And so getting a test or getting a generated result back from the model is still a time consuming process. So if you want to run through hundreds of test cases and do that uh, potentially like 100 or 200 times, um, that, that can take a lot of time and add up to, to a lot of time. Um, producing those test results. Then another is, uh, it's much more difficult to do this for multiple languages, and so Python is a pretty easy one, but having a, a reproducible kind of test environment to do this across, you know, 20, 30, 40 programming languages becomes um, much more difficult to, to do. There's also a lot of tasks that um, are very, uh, not as easily tested, I guess I should say. 
So uh, creating like a login form uh, using HTML, JS, and CSS, for example, or, or different types of, uh, of web completion cases are, are not so easy to kind of you know, run a unit test against and, and tell if the model's generated uh, proper output. Um, and as I said, you know, we, we run through different test cases um, for, for model evaluation, um, you know, get the, the generations, the solutions, and then um, statistically take a look at how many uh, of these test cases the model gets right, for example, on, on the very first try and the first pass. Um, one other really important thing here that uh, we have to be careful of is, is decontamination. So we need to make sure that a lot of the test cases that are included here um, in, in the model generation uh, or, or the code generation aren't, aren't actually included in the training data because then we're uh, biasing our, our results. And this is getting harder and harder to do just as a lot of these models kind of become saturated and, and learn how to write all of these, uh, these various test cases. It's very difficult to leave out and, and have some sort of unseen data that the model uh, will then be able to use for a um, uh, for, for test case that's worth uh, evaluating its performance. We've definitely seen before where we've trained models that, that score really well in these test cases and then just aren't, aren't very easy to use or, or aren't very good at completion. Um, I'll talk really quickly about deployment into, into production. This is Again, a, a much longer topic I could go into. Um, we use Faster Transformer and, and Trident Server. And so this gives us a really optimized, highly optimized layer between the Transformer model and, and the underlying um, GPUs. Uh, Trident Server also gives you some, some additional features, like you can deploy multiple model instances or multiple models per um, instance or, or GPU instance. Uh, it has features such as batching and, and a few other um, things like request cancellation that when you have really low uh, latency needs are, are incredibly useful for um, reducing latency during inference. Um, and then we run this using uh, our auto-scaling infrastructure and uh, we, we already do this at Replit for a lot of the machines that we run and, and all of the containers that we're running at any given time. Um, but then doing this for, uh, for deployed models has all of these unique challenges. And so the model sizes are much larger, and then there's very specific GPU requirements. Um, and we have to do things like dealing with GPU shortages and in individual zones and, and whatnot. Um, quickly go over some, some kind of uh, lessons learned in the, in the process. Um, so data tends to be the most difficult part of the, of the process, laying good pipelines that are scalable and still allow for, for fast iteration. Um, once you have this process built out and laid out, a lot of the iteration is going to come from, uh, from the underlying data sources. So what you sample, what you include, the tokenizers you train, um, really a lot of the model uh, configuration, you, you know, you can, you can change it run it, but um, much, many of the levers you kind of have to actually affect the, the data or the model quality and, and output and, and type are uh, determined by what data you actually feed into the model. And so uh, a big part of that is just having these really scalable pipelines that, that allow you to iterate quickly and um, diving deep and actually just knowing, knowing your data well. Um, evaluation can be more art than science, and so this is really important. We talked about the human eval test results earlier, but, um, but there's nothing like actually putting the model in front of users and allowing them to play with it, see how it feels, how it completes, the latency, how, you know, whether or not it tends to repeat itself, um, all of those types of things that we call model, <coughs> model vibes. We take really seriously at Replit and put it in front of users and kind of test with them for, um, uh, for, you know, 30 minutes or, or so just to see is this thing actually useful for them. Um, and then it's also really uh, important to, to collaborate across the team, we, we've learned. So there's a lot of moving parts that require uh, being, being brought together. And so there are model configurations, for example, on the training side that allow for more advanced features 
uh, but then libraries like Fast Transformer may not be able to support them or may dramatically slow down uh, inference process. And so um, that's one thing that we've learned. It's just it's critical to kind of um, watch the moving parts throughout the entire process and, and make sure that uh, everyone is working together. Um, just some really quick background on like what what we've noticed um, makes a good engineer who works in, in this space. Uh, one is the, the right mix of research and, and engineering mindset. And so um, this means someone who has a research mindset but can also do the engineering that's involved um, and, and required to uh, actually test these ideas, train these models, and, and deploy them into, into production. Um, experience working with data at scale, obviously, matters. And so, um, you know, if you use like the transformers library, that's that's great. And um, but but the ability to also move that into more distributed kind of pipelines that where you can analyze, say, 2.7 terabytes of, of data at scale are, is is really important. Obviously, a, a solid technical background. So the more you have an understanding of the stats, computer science, algos, and, and data structures underneath really helps. Um, and then if you're really skilled in, in software development, so um, that obviously includes programming, but also the libraries and frameworks, things like PyTorch and TensorFlow, um, and uh, as well as the CI CD process. So that fast iteration loop, if, you, um, if you're an engineer that uh, kind of appreciates CI CD and builds it into everything that they do, that type of thing really helps you when it comes time to training these models and, and doing it in an iterative way. And just last little propaganda is that we're hiring on, on my team. Um, if you're interested in working on these types of problems, definitely come talk to me. Uh, we'd, we'd love to speak with you about opportunities at Replit.